tonight I've been doing some work on the little Austin 7 there. I am just about ready to take it for to get it revinned. Uh, but one thing I wanted to change was the the number plate lamps that I was using. So I was going to use these sort of modern LED uh, they're used on motorcycles and they're sort of bolt lamps so that always kind of annoyed me that to um, to get the lamp on you, you bolt you bolt it through the number plate but of course you have to thread the wire all the way through first and then connect the wire up which just seems kind of daft so I wanted to change to a more traditional sort of lamp and I ended up getting one of these little reproduction uh, Lucas type ones I do actually have an original of these somewhere uh, I just haven't found it yet but this is kind of what they look like um, these are on the back of the EMG. I've got one on the instrument panel as a map light as well. So this is just a reproduction and it comes with the, the rubber base, which I'm missing on my original one, and a lamp holder. And this is a lamp holder for a, a BAT-15, I think it is, bulb, which they look like this. You can get them with smaller globes because if you use this size, it, it won't actually fit. But these are very bright so this has got an LED bulb in it and they're really really bright and they they really give off a bit too much light and you're not allowed to have any white light shining backwards on a car in New Zealand so I went through my box of bits and pieces and my all sorts of wires and bulbs and things and I found one of these which is actually a um, I think it's a lamp that goes in the back of a gauge, like a, a Smith's type gauge. And these take a much smaller and a bit more reasonable light-wise bulb. Also, not being an LED, they're not polarized, so uh, this should work. Ah, and I think I've managed to pick the... oh, there we go. Um, I thought I'd picked a, bulb, a blown bulb, but no, that's okay. And these, these are a much, much softer, dimmer light, which is all you need for the number plate lamp. And to be honest, I'm not really intending to be driving that car after dark anyway. So it's just it just needs it to be able to get its, its warrant of fitness. So I have extended this wire, and I've drilled holes in the body so I can actually mount this thing in there so I'm going to do that next the way I'm going to mount this is because it's an aluminium body I don't need an earth because the whole body is earthed and I can just poke that through a hole um, from the inside of the boot and I'm going to use a rubber grommet or a piece of rubber hose and push that over the end here and that'll just sort of clamp it in place clamp it in the hole and that should work quite well so I'm going to set that up now this is how the lamp looks mounted on the body of the car. So you can see around the, the outside of the bulb holder, I, I fitted a piece of rubber tube. And it just happens that that rubber tube is also the same diameter as the hole in the middle of the rubber gasket that came with the light. So that actually holds everything in there quite nicely. And the cover will just bolt on there like that. And that should provide me enough light for the number plate. Uh, without being too bright and it doesn't have any white light shining directly backwards which meets the requirement in New Zealand uh, the wiring because it's earthing through the aluminium body it's just a single wire and I'm just going to tie that up to the uh, the steel chassis rail there uh, the steel frame brother and that'll just keep it out of the way I'll put it tuck it right up behind there and then it can't get damaged by anything rattling around inside the the boot. It's actually reasonably dark now. The sun's going down. I've got the lamp mounted there on the tail. Uh, the glass was actually a little bit rattly in the housing so I ended up putting a little a strip of plastic which is just a, a, a tail of one of the cable ties under the top there so that when this is bolted down it pulls everything tight and the glass doesn't rattle and it makes a nice seal around the rubber gasket so if we 
Turn the lights on. Yeah, I think that'll work fine. Uh, you can see there's, there's not a lot of light going backwards and it should light up the number plate, I think. I won't know till I've got one. Uh, the wiring's all tucked away neatly inside the framing, or, or alongside the framing rather. So, I think that looks much, much cleaner than the, the bolt-on kind. So, yeah, I think I'm pretty happy with that. I finally took this for a decent test run. We live rurally now, so the roads there are really quiet, so I took it down to the beach and back. And it's the first time I've had it up to speed. Um, the speedo is completely off, so interestingly, at 50 kilometers per hour, it reads about, uh, it's 50 kilometers an hour on the gauge is showing about 60 miles per hour, uh, which is interesting. But finally got it up to speed. It is coughing and spluttering. I actually needed to use choke to, to keep the engine running. Um, you can see it was spitting and backfiring. It's left a, oh yes, um, left a nice mark on the bonnet there. Uh, there's some kind of fuel leak from somewhere. I think that's, I think that's oil actually. Um, so I'm not sure where that's coming from. That's possibly oil out of the dash pot. And it's leaking a lot of oil down. That's from the valve cover. So that probably needs a bit of tightening. Uh, I can't really see the other side at the moment. The oil piping all looks good. And the oil filter. Definitely had good oil pressure, so that's no problem. Uh, obviously good pressure if it's leaking it out. But yeah, a bit more tweaking on the carb, I think, to get it running. But that proved that everything's running enough to uh, get it on the road, I hope. It's, it's warm. No, it's fairly hot. It's not burning, burning hot. But uh, it was successful. A bit more tweaking of the tuning. One of the other things I've done with the car is I started looking a bit more closely at the the sort of hole I had in the throttle response and I took a, a closer look at the downdraft carb I've got on the car and the thing with downdraft carbs is normally this is up the other way so the the damper inside there which is this piece goes up and down assisted by gravity um, the way this works is if I can get that out the only bit that's really meant to be touching is that thinner rod in the middle which which goes up and down inside the the um, the dash pot part there the tube and uh, that's the bit that you oil because that's meant to be the only slide in contact. So you can see how the piston slides up and down in the housing, but it's not supposed to be touching all around the edges here. And in the vertical ones where it's that way, that's a bit easier to manage because there's no side loads on the, on the piston. On the downdrafts like this, because it's lying on its side, if there's any slop in that middle piston and cylinder, this outer thing can rub and it can stick and I think that's what's happening on this carburetor. Um, in the downdraft ones you also have a big spring inside here to, to help push this back. Um, of course also the spring is going to have an effect on how how much force there is stopping that piston going, going up. Um, the what I found with this one is this car body had been, I think they'd blasted it at some point, bead blasted it, because the, the brass piston was, was quite 
a sort of matte dull finish and after playing around it with it a little bit I sort of polished it up and after doing that I was able to move it up and down in position on the carburetor like this and I was able to see that it was actually scratching scraping so I carefully polished just the part where it scrapes so I do have a, a car manual I think it's from my MGB that actually mentions this and it does say if there is any rubbing off that that outer brass part uh, you can polish it so that there's clearance there because there is supposed to be clearance but you don't want too much because that actually has to be a, a, a it's not an airtight fit but it needs to um, to seal fairly well so I polished the minimal amount I could to stop it stop it scraping rubbing and that's definitely made a difference it's it's a lot a lot more free now um, the interesting thing is with these SUs, they don't have any sort of accelerator pump. So the way it works, when you when you open the throttle, what's supposed to happen is the because of the inertia in this piston, it doesn't move straight away, which means you get a higher air through airflow through the throat of the carb, um, which sucks more fuel through until this all kind of equalizes. So exactly how the spring affects all of that it, it all gets a bit strange um, but after doing that and putting it all back together it does seem a bit better I haven't driven it on the road yet to to really check but definitely starting it and um, running it when it's warmed up seems a lot better there doesn't seem to be as much of a hole in the throttle response but I do I do find still if, if I open the throttle up quickly uh, it does bog down still, so I probably need to go back and reset up the the um, the mixture, which is this nut here. You you adjust that up and down, which changes the mixture. And of course, I do have my um, my exhaust oxygen exhaust sensor that I can bolt into the manifold and and check it properly. But uh, definitely seems to be working a bit better now. So I'm sort of I'm on the right track, I think. Uh, this is a second downdraft carb that I've got that was damaged that I've repaired where part of the housing is broken off. Uh, I need to get a rebuild kit for this. Uh, if I go ahead and supercharge this car, I'll probably use this carburetor just because it's got the, the mounting flange for an air filter. And I think it would be a good idea to, to have an air filter on there. But uh, you, you can see this is pretty much the same carb. One thing I did look at doing was swapping around the dash pot and piston off this carb and putting it on this one. And sometimes you can get away with that. Um, I think the, the dash pots and pistons are kind of a matched set. But what I found is I couldn't put this, this dash pot onto this body. It just wouldn't fit. Um, without modifying it and I didn't really want to do that so that's why I ended up cleaning up the original one so it's it's going to take a bit more playing around I think I'll have to do a lot more road testing with it but it's definitely getting better I wasn't sure if I should talk about this or not um, in these little films but my friend and mentor who taught me how to do all of the metalwork and how to build a car um, not just the technical stuff and the and the sheet metal stuff but and the welding and all those kind of things but also what a car should be and what story it should tell and how you should think about it when you're building one um, sadly he died recently and uh, yeah I'm not sure if I've, I think I've mentioned it before in the past, but uh, the Riley here was, it, it was his car basically to start off with. And he collected the parts over many years. Uh, I think it was kind of one of his dream cars to build. And he realized he didn't really have the, the funds to, to, to build it. So it ended up coming to me. And the idea was, um, you know, he'd help me build it. He'd teach me how to build it and I'd put it together. Uh, I ended up moving to Wellington, so the car came with me. 
but the idea was still to to build the car and uh, eventually he got sick he got cancer and that's kind of when I really started thinking well I need to to, to start getting going on this car um, I really just want to get it built uh, like I say it was his dream car so you know I kind of owe it to him to, to build it and build it properly and build it how it should be so that kind of explains why I've been going so hard out on this car for, for a while and I was hoping I would have it sitting on its wheels for him to see it. Um, I'm so close now. I've mentioned a number of times I just need to make the rear spring, uh, the front rear spring mounts. And then the springs can be mounted. And then pretty much I, I, could, I could get it on, on its wheels. So that's still the aim. I'm, I'm still going to try and... I need to do this car, I need to build this car, it's very important. Um, I think doing the body without him to help me is going to be difficult. Uh, it's going to take me a while, I think. So the Austin 7, that's it's taken me 10 years to build that. And yes, I have moved around, I've moved cities, I've moved house twice in that time. Uh, but that's now so close to going on the road. The finishing off the little number plate lamp is basically the last thing I needed to do before I can take it for uh, to get it road legal. But the Riley doing the Brooklyn's with the mechanics of it, I, I don't feel too worried about doing that. Uh, obviously, I'm still learning. Um, basically, that my vintage car experience is that Austin 7 but like I say I've been working on it for 10 years I've been trying to learn everything I can I've got a lot more confident with working with these older vehicles and the systems in them and how the steering boxes work and how the gearboxes work and the suspension and the brakes and all that kind of stuff and to be honest once you start looking into it and you start researching it and reading about it and looking at cars it's not all that complicated um, this is 100 year old technology it's not that sophisticated and if you're just careful you can you can do things relatively easily um, it still takes me quite a few goes sometimes to get things right but I'm definitely getting more and more confident with what I'm doing the bodywork however is another story um, I kind of know in theory how to do it um, I think people who've been watching some of these films will have seen how long it took me to do the guards because I was kind of working it out by myself as I went along. And my friend was helping me. He, he was offering suggestions and things and uh, he had a very good way of teaching you where he'd, he'd show, he'd demonstrate and explain and then let you do it yourself. And sometimes he'd let me do it myself and do it wrong. And then at the end, tell me, well, say to me well why did you do it that way you could have done it like this and I'd sit there and say oh of course how obvious but of course it isn't obvious when you've never done it before and you don't know but that was always a really good way to learn the lesson um, just simple things so for example the guards if you look at this guard the shape of it there's a little bit of a curve there and there's the curve over the wheel I made that as three pieces effectively the sides the top and the other side uh, but after I'd done that he said to me well why did you make the middle in three pieces that's just straight that's flat you could just make it from one piece flat with the sides bent down which once you've been told that yeah that's obvious but uh, I was just so focused on building it the way I was building it I, it didn't even occur to me um, and so not having someone like that to explain things, um, show me the best ways to do things, and just encourage me and, um, you know, make, make sure I do everything properly in the way it's supposed to be and, and true to period and true to the story of the car, which is very important. So I'm, I'm going to keep going on this, on the Riley. I want to get it on its wheels, get it to be a rolling chassis. I want to start assembling the engine. Uh, the gearbox is there, 
the engine I need to do a test fit of the um, the con rods on the crank I need to make sure the flywheel is sitting correctly on the crank and then I can send the rotating parts off to be balanced and then once that comes back I can start actually assembling the engine um, with the engine assembled I can mount that in the car uh, I have all the parts to build the rear axle I need to clean this up obviously and paint it uh, same with the torque tube clean all that up and paint it um, and then it's just things like the brakes getting the brakes working and slowly you break it down so the cooling system the electrical system the fuel system all of that kind of stuff um, but building the body and getting that correct that's that's it's going to be difficult for me i think but i'll give it a go uh, and the thing with these old cars is you you can always build another body rip the old one off build another one put it on so that's kind of where i'm at with the riley at the moment um yeah it's just it's it, it's it's just a funny time <laughs>